link uh, the lecture? Well, that will be updated after each lecture, okay. roughly the same day, and also the okay. lecture notes, and also the recorded lecture link. Okay, I hope that is uh, clear. Okay, so uh, let's start the uh, course material. So as you know, the mean curvature flow that we are studying is a gradient flow. of the area functional. So it is variational in nature, and it is probably the most natural way that you can evolve a hypersurface in an ambient manifold. So as a gradient flow, indeed it is the negative gradient flow. not the positive gradient flow. So as a gradient flow, it will flow a hypersurface in a direction that it can decrease area the fastest. So, So to start the course, we will start by which direction that you can actually go to decrease the area fastest. That is the, in the direction of mean curvature. So you are flowing a hypersurface in the direction of mean curvature. So first, variation and mean curvature. So given a hypersurface, let's call this sigma n, we will mostly be concerned about hypersurfaces in Euclidean space and hypersurfaces called dimension one. So hypersurfaces are locally, locally they are graphs over their tangent planes. So to do the computation of the local geometry, so it will su suffice to do the computation through local graphs. So we will start with that computation of local graphs first. So computation. on graphs. Say you have a U from a domain in Rn to R. So any hypersurface can be represented locally like this in Rn plus one. Then you can compute the area of the graph of U. which is the integration of the area form, of course. And the area form is one plus grad u square. This is from your calculus course. Now we want to compute how the area is going to change. So we want to compute the directional derivative of the area functional at a given graph. Right. So in this case, you view area as a functional on the space of um, 
hypersurfaces or generalized hypersurface. or generalized. And at each point of the space, you get a hypersurface. You view each, you view each hypersurface as a point in the space of hypersurfaces. And you want to compute, if you want to vary the hypersurface in the direction eta, say eta is a, vector field. Sorry, eta is a variation. So you want to vary the graph. So this uh, for each eta, let's consider compactly supported variation. So C compactly supported in omega. Then you consider this one parameter family of variation in the direction of eta, starting at the point, at the, at the point u. So you will have u plus t eta. So it's varying in the direction eta. This is a one parameter family. And you can correspondingly compute the area of this family. Graph of UT. Similarly, that is equal to one plus grad u plus t grad eta squared dx. And then the directional derivative of the area functional in the direction eta. In direction eta at the point U. So U, U is viewed as a point in the space of hypersurfaces. That is going to be the derivative T. So for this family, when T equals to zero, it is exactly U of the area graph of UT. Oops. And you can put this formula back into this uh, derivative. When you differentiate that, and you evaluate at t equal to zero. Two grad u plus t grad eta. And then when you differentiate with respect to t, you get grad eta. And when, when t is equal to zero, you get one plus grad u square, grad u, grad eta. And then you can do integration by part to put the derivative on eta to the derivative on the other term in the product. And that comes out a negative sign. Divergence of grad u. Divergence 
times eta dx. Right, this is the formula. And we see that the graph from this formula, we see that the graph of u is a critical point for area functional if and only if for any variation, this derivative has, has to be zero. So any directional derivative has to be zero, which means that you have the equation divergence of grad u over one plus grad u square. This is equal to zero. And this is defined to be the mean curvature of the graph. This is the mean curvature scalar. Right. The mean curvature scalar. Any questions up to now? Um, sorry, why do you have the minus in front, like when you define the mean curvature scalar? Because like when you say zero, like the minus. Right. So you want the, so you want the mean curvature to actually be a direction that the area decreases fastest. Actually, uh, I think there's no negative sign here. Let me check first. Yeah, there's no negative sign here. Sorry about that. Yeah. So this is the mean curvature vector. I mean, uh, you will see later that the, the sign of the mean curvature is actually a, I don't think it's a very, very wise definition because uh, you will have to change the sign from time to time. When you talk about the mean curvature vector and the mean curvature scalar, you have to change the sign. We'll see that later. So well, actually this is the definition. There's no um, negative sign here. Let me add another page here. Right, we want to uh, further rewrite this equation. So you have a graph and uh, you can compute the upward unit normal of the graph. Which is easy. That's negative grad u. We denote it by n and then one. I have to normalize it by the length of this vector, which is square root, square root of one plus square u squared. And now you can rewrite this uh, above variational formula. So you have d dt of the area of graph. May I ask a question? Yes. What do you wrote down in this inner product? So you wrote down minus an upper u and then comma something. Is it a dot or is it c? Which line are you talking about? About your formula of the unit, uh, upward unit normal. Oh, yes. One. Uh, that's a vector. That's a row vector. Okay. So this is a vector in Rn plus one. So grad u is uh, a vector in Rn. And mm -hmm. there's a one in okay. the 10 plus one direction, right? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And now you can rewrite. Really 
So this is going to be, uh, again, negative. But you, uh, so you multiply by, you multiply by this upper unit normal here. Divergence of grad u over one plus grad u square. Uh, let me write it in another page. Perhaps that's better. All right. Uh, well, this is the upward unit normal. And also let's denote a variational vector field. In this case, uh, you have the variation function is eta and that gives a vector field. That is zero in the first uh, n component and eta in the upward uh, in the n plus one component. This is also a vector in R n plus one. And then let's write this. Oops, sorry. Let's write this variational formula graph of U T. You have um, negative divergence of grad u and then you have the inner product of n and v and then uh, let's move this a little bit left so that I can write it in one line times So n dot v is exactly one over one plus grad u square. So that cancels out. And what is the one plus grad u square? That is the area functional. Oh, sorry, that's the area element. So we can. So the reason that we want to write it like this is to, we want an intrinsic express, expression using the induced metric on the graph. So now you can use, uh, you can write it as a graph, uh, as an integration on the graph. And this is our mean curvature vector. So we haven't defined that yet. So let's keep it first here. Times n and then inner product with v. And then you have d mu graph of u. So because this is the area element. So you will get the area element on the graph. And we call the mean curvature vector to be the mean curvature scalar times the negative of the normal. So you have a change of sign here. In this case, you see that it's uh, expressed as negative divergence of grad u times n. And then you can rewrite the first variational formula Sorry, so let's move this downward a little bit so that we can finish the equation. So this is going to be written as graph, integration on the graph of u, and then mean curvature vector times the variational field. And then you're, you're integrating using the induced measure on the graph d mu graph. And this is the definition of a mean curvature vector and mean curvature scalar of a graph. 
Um, sorry again, I, what was V? What is V? V is the variation of U. But is it, is it a function or is it a... So you are varying. So let me draw a, let me draw a picture here. So this is the graph, U, and you are varying upward. So this is uh, U plus T eta. And this can be viewed as a variation in the normal direction. Sorry, this can be viewed as a variation with the variation vector field. Sigma equal to graph of U. This is, uh, this is the original graph. And this variation, you can view it as sigma plus TV, where V is defined to be this, uh, so let me move it here. Zero in the, in the first n component and eta in the n plus one component. And this, uh, is there any other questions? So this defines the mean curvature vector for a graph. As we mentioned earlier, any hypersurfaces you can locally represent it as a graph. So this local geometry can all be computed using graphical computations like this. So in general, sigma n in Rn plus one, a hypersurface, and you have a variation. Then d dt of the area, sigma n plus TV, you evaluate at zero is equal to the mean curvature vector times the variation of U. And you are integrating using the, in, the induced measure on the hypersurface. And as you can see, so now H, this vector, can be viewed as a L2 gradient of the area functional. So among all the variation that have a fixed L2 norm, if you vary in the direction, in the direction vector field that is equal to the mean curvature field, vector field, then that is going to, that direction is going to decrease the area of the fastest, right? And then with the mean curvature, then we can define the mean curvature flow and minimal surface. So let's first define minimal surface. So these are surfaces such that if the mean curvature is zero, you call it a minimal surface. Minimal surface if and only if the mean curvature is equal to zero. And mean curvature flow, just as the name says, so you're flowing in the direction of mean curvature. So each velocity, the velocity at each time should be equal to the mean curvature vector field. So we first uh, write it as, um, 
equation d dt of x. So let x denote the position vector. All right. So where x sigma is the position vector. of the hypersurface at each point. So it's a vector in Rn plus one, of course. And H, again, is the mean curvature vector. So if you vary a, you're flowing a hypersurface such that when you project the time derivative to the normal direction, you fix it to be the mean curvature vector. That's an evolution of mean curvature of a hypersurface. Any questions? Okay, so, um, so now we have an equation. So we want to analyze this equation. So the First most important property of this equation is that it's a parabolic equation. So to see the parabolicity, we again write it using the graphical equation to see the parabolicity. So the graphical equation. For mean curvature flow. So remember there's the projection vector here. Well, again, you are considering a graph from Rn times R to R. So now you have a time variable. And ut is actually the direction in the upward, it's the upward speed. And you want, to, you want to project it to the normal direction. And remember that we have computed the upward unit normal. When you project it, you get the factor of one plus grad u square. So that's the left-hand side. And the right-hand side, you get the mean curvature. So that's divergence of grad u. So that's the graphical mean curvature flow equation. You can rewrite it using local coordinate. So it might not be so easy to see the parabolicity at the moment, but you write it in local coordinate equivalently. Ut is equal to delta ij minus So in local coordinate, it's written like this. Any questions up to now? So the claim is that this equation is parabolic. What does it mean by parabolic? It means that the coefficients are a positive definite matrix, a uniformly positive definite matrix. So in general, this equation, you can't, a priori, it's not parabolic if you don't have a gradient bound. So the claim is that if you have a gradient bound, say less or equal than C, less than infinity, then the equation is parabolic. Right, in this case, you can compute the coefficient matrix, say this is your a i j. If you have a gradient bound, then your a i j, your a i i, 
you just need to compute the diagonal element, right? AII is one minus DIU, DIU over. And by the, by the gradient bound, this is going to be, sorry, this is going to be greater or equal than one minus C squared. Sorry, there's no, um, there's no square root here. One plus C square, which is greater or equal than one plus C square over one. So as long as C doesn't go to infinity, this is strictly greater than zero. And it is uniformly parabolic. Uniformly, oops. Any questions up to now? What's the DIU term? Oh, DIU, um, so this I is the, so remember omega is a domain in Rn. So in Rn, you have uh, the standard, and then you have Xn plus, and then you have T. So the xi and xj's are coordinate in the first, uh, in this domain. You view it as a graphical equation. And diu and dju are derivative, partial derivative in these xi's and xj's. That's a, uh, right. Oops, uh, something's wrong with my pen. D I U is equal to D D X I of U. So these are notations that we are using. Any other questions? Okay, so um So we see that as long as there's a gradient bound, you have, um, you have a parabolicity. And as a consequence of the parabolicity, you will have, uh, you have maximum principles. So there are various versions of maximum principles that we will get to and use during this course. And let's talk about the first one. So this is stronger than the This, this one is actually stronger than just the parabolicity of this U. It's about the difference of U. And for that reason, we call this, this first version of maximum principle to be the tangential principle. All right. So suppose U1 and U2 are both solutions to the mean curvature flow, graphical equation. And such that one of them is lying entirely on the other side of the second one. So say U1 is greater than U2 everywhere, but 
So u1 is greater than u2 everywhere on a parabolic ball in a backward So this is a notation that we will use very often during the course as well. So we call a parabolic ball closure centered at zero, zero to be the points X and T such that X is less or equal than R and T is between Let's move it left hand side. Negative R squared to zero. So this is backward. So only up to zero for T, but it goes backward. R N plus one cross R. Sorry, R N plus R N cross R. And we call it parabolic because the radius in T is uh, the square of the radius in X. So these parabolic neighborhood and parabolic balls are very natural to consider for a parabolic equation, as we will see later. So in this parabolic ball, it's strictly greater than that. And also, it has a touching point, say, an interior touching point in the parabolic ball. So in this case, zero, zero is an interior point. Then we have u1 constantly equal to u2 in the whole parabolic ball. So let me draw a picture which is impossible for mean curvature flow. Say so u1 and u2. So they cannot touch like this. Tangential to each other and one is entirely lying on the other side of the other one in an interior space time point. So this is what this tangential principle says. Okay. And this has very important consequences. So there are three important consequences that we recorded here. The first consequence Move it upward. Corollary one. Okay, uh, right. I haven't proved this, but uh, so this is our first exercise indeed. So uh, exercise. So this is not coming directly from the para parabolicity of the graph. So because you are considering the difference of two graphs, so you need to do derive the equation satisfied by equation satisfied by V equal to U1 minus U2 and show that this is a parabolic equation. by showing the coefficient matrix to be positive definite. All right, a uniformly parabolic. So that's our first exercise. Any questions? Okay, so uh, let's continue with the consequences of this tangential principle. The first, uh, the first consequence is 
what we call avoidance principle. So recall that evolving hypersurfaces are locally graphs. So if you consider sigma one and sigma two are disjoint hypersurfaces in Rm plus one, then the mean curvature flow evolution of sigma one, sigma two stays disjoint. Why? Because uh, initially they are disjoint. So if they ever touch, if they ever intersect, the first touch, the, the first intersection point has to be a touching point, right? Either sigma one, sigma two, touch like this, or they might be inside of each other like this. But whichever case it is, so you can see the local graphical equation. At the touching point, they have the same tangent. at first touching point. And in the locally parabolic neighborhood of that touching point, so you can choose the neighborhood small enough so that it is still graphical, of course. And then you will, and then you move the touching point to space time zero. So by, by reparametrization, you can always do that. And then you get the interior touching point violating the, this is a violation. Of tangential principle. So hypersurfaces if they are disjoint, they stay disjoint. It's the first corollary. And the second consequence is preservation of embeddedness. And this is just what it says, literally. So if sigma is embedded, stays embedded as long as the flow is smooth. All right, so uh, the same happen, uh, the same condition for the first one. So as long as the mean curvature flow of both are smooth. When they are smooth, these properties are preserved. And the proof is the same as the first corollary. So if it violates embeddedness, it will have a first touching point. And the third corollary is finite time singularities. So that is what make mean curvature flow complicated because singularities are inevitable. So if sigma n closed, then mean curvature flow develops singularity in finite time.
Right. Um, so uh, why? Because uh, for any closed hypersurface, you can enclose it by a large enough ball. large enough sphere, right? So you're flowing the sphere, not the ball. And then they're disjoint, so that they're disjoint. And then they should stay disjoint for all time, as long as the flow is smooth. However, we'll see later that the evolution of spheres become extinct in finite time. So it will sh the outside sphere, it will sh become extinct and shrinks to a round point in finite time. And because the preservation of disjointness of these two surfaces, so sigma has to develop a singularity before that time too. That is inevitable. Okay, so uh, it's 11.26, so let's, uh, Let's mention a few examples and then we will take a few minutes break, like a five minutes break. So example. So the first one is uh, the round sphere. And round cylinders. Say it's a uh, S K of radius R naught times. So it's an n-dimensional hypersurface. So we complement the complement the dimension by crossing flat factors n minus k. You can compute. So because these are these are constant curvature. All the for the for the round sphere, these are constant curvature and umbilic. You can compute that all the principal curvatures are constant and they're equal to one over the radius. Lambda k equal to one over r. And the mean curvature is what? The mean curvature is equal to the sum of the principal curvatures, which is R over K. Sorry, we should use a different index. Use J here instead of K, because K is used. Okay. And the normal, the normal projection of the velocity is actually equal to the change of rate of the radius because of the symmetry, right? The velocity, the norm of the velocity should be equal to the change of the rate of the radius of R of T should be equal to H, which is equal to R T over K. And you have the initial radius equal to R zero. So you solve this ODE. This gives that R of T is equal to R zero square minus two KT. Then you take square root. And of course it's extinct in finite time.
Right. So this is the ingredient in the proof of the inevitability of the singularities because spheres develop finite time singularities. Any questions up to now? Okay, the second example. So the first one are actually shrinking hom uh, homothetically as a symmetric space is shrinking homothetically until it becomes extinct. So if you, um, usually the, the simplest examples of these evolution equations that you want to construct is you want to apply some symmetry conditions. So that reduce, using, using enough symmetry conditions, you can reduce the PDE problem to an ODE problem, which you can solve if it has a solution, and that gives you a solution. So the second symmetry we want to impose is the translational symmetry. So suppose you want the flow. Oops. To evolve with constant speed in one direction. So let's say in upward direction up to reparametrization constant speed upward. And these are called, they have a name, these are called translating solitons. So if you compute the So if you want to add the time symmetry such that u of x of t is equal to u of x at zero plus t. So this is the time symmetry you want to add. So it's the same graph, but translating up. And then you have um, ut is constantly equal to one. And this is equal to, so let's say in one dimension. Why is it equal to one? Uh, sorry, what's your question? Why is it equal to one? Oh, because uh, you compute the first one is um, you have a separation of variables. So this is saying that u of x of t can be written as the first component is independent of t. So when you differentiate partial, partial derivative with respect to t, you get one, right? So in one direction, so remember the graphical equation in one dimension, we can write it as ut equal to one plus ux square, ux, one plus ux square derivative. This is equal to, and if this equal to one, this gives you an ODE. Solve ODE one equal to U X X. So you can have solutions like this. So U of X of T equal to negative log of cosine x plus t for t in, sorry, for x 
in negative pi over two to pi over two. So the cosine has to be positive in order for the log to be well-defined. And what is the graph of this? Let's show it. So at negative pi over two and pi over two. So it's a shape like this. And the mean curvature flow evolution of this graph is translating upward. So I also leave it as an exercise to, to let you check that this, um, this explicit solution satisfy the ODE. And this also have a name. This particular translating soliton also have a name. It's called the Green Reaper because it looks like a green reaper, reaping out everything. So it's an eternal solution. They come from time negative infinity and goes to time positive infinity, and it will sweep out this whole strip region. Any questions about these examples? Um, sorry, mm -hmm. could you please go up? Mm -hmm. page. Uh, can you tell me like you've got this expression one equal to square root of one plus u x square. How did you get from that part to the bottom part? Like from that you mean part? here? Yeah. So how did you get from the top to the bottom? Oh um, you, you've just taken one derivative, right? Is that u x over square root of one plus u x squared over yes. times? When you differentiate the one over square root in the in the denominator, you will get something like uh, to the power two, uh, three over two. And then when you mm -hmm. multiply this square root, you will get the one plus US square. And yeah, then you, you say that you, you have two terms, I can differentiate that, right? Sorry? So when you differentiate UX divided by square root of one plus UX squared, like you have two terms there. You differentiate the denominator and the denominator as well. Yes, it is. Why is there only one term in the answer? Well, you, you are going to differentiate both the numerator and the denominator, of course. Yes. But um, let me see. All right. I mean, this is the graphical equation. You just rewrite it in the, you just rewrite it in the, so this is the time that we take a break. But um, we'll take a five, five minutes break, but let me write this down for you. So this is equal to u x x minus u x square over. So this is the graphical equation that we obtain in any direction. If you apply in one D, you get this. And so it cancels out because uh, you have uxx plus uh, uxx times ux square, and then you minus this term, right? Cancels out. So you can check it yourself. I can go back to the graphical equation that I write down previously, which is right, this one. So you can apply in one D, that is what exactly what you get. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thanks. Okay. So let's take a five minutes break. Or you can if you have any other questions you can ask. Oh, I haven't checked the chat. Is there any question? No. Okay. Oh, by the way, I have to, uh, because they require me to take a picture of who is attending. So I'm going to take a picture of the participant here. I'm going to take a screenshot here.
Um, sorry, I've got another question. Yes. I, in the last part of the website, all the points are not included in the lectures. If you don't have them, are you going to put them on the lecture notes? Sorry, I can't hear you clearly. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Well, basically, I was asking, like in the lecture notes, which you posted on your website, like you don't have some of the proofs, like what you've done, like now in the class, like are you going to update the lecture notes with those proofs? I will update the lecture notes, yes, constantly. Okay, but so uh, the first, the first few, uh, the, the, the material for the first two, three lectures are already there. So it's okay. just not finished yet, the lecture notes. Uh, the point I was trying to make, for example, like, in your lecture notes, for example, if you go on example 1.9, like you don't have the whole proof, which you just showed right now. Uh, oh, right, right, yes. Uh, so the, the video lectures will be updated too. And I will also fill in, fill in the proof of the lecture notes if you want that too. Yeah, if you don't mind doing that as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let's resume since the time is quite limited. So then, uh, next kind of example is uh, more abstract or more of a property. So we call parabolic rescaling or translation. So you can create new examples of mean curvature flow from old ones by scalings or translations in space-time. Okay. So let's say, so this is more examples. So let's say, M denotes a mean curvature flow, say sigma t, and t is from A to B in a time interval. And for any rescaling factor, a rescaling factor is a positive number in R plus, and for any translational vector in space-time, say x naught t naught in Rm plus one cross R, then we define the parabolic translation and rescaling, so dilation by lambda of the of the original flow and you also translate in space time by x naught t naught so this is defined to be sigma tilde t where for this new flow the domain of definition is going to change in space time. So T is going to be now defined in, you have to parabolically translate and dilate the time interval two, which makes it lambda square A 
minus t naught lambda square b minus t naught. And this tilde t, sigma tilde t, is defined to be you dilate in space by lambda, but you dilate in time by lambda square. T over lambda square. And you translate in time in T naught and you translate in space by X naught. Right. So this is the parabolic rescaling or dilation. And dilation. So you will see that uh, if sigma t satisfies mean curvature flow, so is sigma tilde t. So this is uh, purely because of the parabolicity. So you dilate in space by lambda because the two derivatives in space, that will cancel out the dilation in time, which is uh, lambda square. And notice that uh, spheres, round spheres, not any sphere, round spheres and cylinders are parabolic dilation invariant with respect to their extinction point. So if you choose X naught, namely is a point of extinction. So without loss of generality, you see that um, the evolution, if you move the extinction point of uh, evolving round spheres around cylinders to zero or uh, to space time zero, then you will have R T square is equal to negative two and T. When the flow become extinct at time zero and at the space origin. And in this case, right, so if you dilate the time t by lambda square and you dilate the lambda, uh, r by lambda, so it will cancel out. So it's still exactly the same flow. So it's invariant, invariant under parabolic dilations. So these are, uh, we will see later, we see that if a flow is parabolic dilation with respect to zero, zero, then the flow is going to be evolved just like the sphere by self similarly shrinking. And we will call such a thing self shrinker. We'll get to that in probably the second lecture. And these are important examples because these are going to be the model for the singularity of the mean curvature flow. So singularities of mean curvature flow, you can um, do a zoom in procedure and see that they asymptotically look like such solutions, such special solutions with symmetry. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, the next topic that we will get to is uh, local well postness. So we have talked about several properties and examples of mean curvature flow, but we haven't talked about that they actually exist. But this is not a problem for a short time. Local well postness. So uh, 
there are some issues here, but of course they're already dealt with in the history. So let me mention what is the potential issue for local web hostness. I recall that the mean curvature flow is defined to be dx dt projection that is equal to the mean curvature vector. And this problem is not well posed. Uh, sorry, this problem is um, this problem is not uh, no, sorry not 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 well posed. It's uh, not strictly parabolic. So you're only requiring that the velocity field to be projected to the normal direction that's equal to the, to the uh, mean curvature vector, but you have a huge amount of freedom that you can compose with a diffeomorphism and you get the same flow. Because uh, if you compose with diffeomorphisms, that will only create tangential self diffeomorphisms that will only create tangential vector field. So that is not going to affect the projection to the normal direction. So you have a large dimension of kernels, actually infinite dimension of kernels. So that making this problem not parabolic as a system, as a mapping problem. But you can deal with this by noticing that the mean curvature flow equation is equivalent you restrict that each point can only be flown in the normal direction that will kill the large dimension of kernel And now you will also change the system of equation because this x is a vector in Rn plus one. So this is a system. But you, if, you only consider, if you only consider normal graphical perturbations, evolutions, so you only allow points to move in normal direction. So that changed the vector equation to a scalar equation. Because you can locally represent it as a graph over the original hypersurface and you consider the graphical equation. And this graphical equation, as we see before, it's uniformly parabolic. So let's uh, write down the lemma that we are going to apply to imply the local well postness. So this, um, in this case, because we change it to a graphical equation, so we only need to apply the theory for scalar parabolic equation, the local existence theory for scalar parabolic equation. So say, du dt is uh, evolving in the direction it might be nonlinear. Well, in this case, it is nonlinear. Depending on u, it's derivative, it's second derivative, the Hessian. And you can linearize it.
linearize Q at say U naught. So that will give the linearization L of H equal to you differentiate Q with respect to Uij and then D square and you are evaluating at U naught and you differentiate in these other directions so let me also move this equation to the left a little bit. Here. And then plus dq over dui, and then also evaluate that u naught dh dxi plus dq du u naught h. So this is the linearization at u naught and the theorem that we're going to apply is that if the top term of the linearization which is this term highest order term if is uniformly positive definite then the flow has local existence And this is uh, easy to check for our graphical equations. So we just choose xi, xj to be a local coordinate on the tangent plane. And we call that our graphical equation is what? So our ut is equal to delta i j minus d i u d j u one plus squared u square d i j u so this is your q of u grad u grad square passion u so if you differentiate that with respect to the hessian That is and previously in the first part of our first lecture, we already showed that this is a positive definite matrix. Because we computed that all the diagonal elements are positive and that gives the positive definite any questions so this is the local existence theory so we have the theorem so if sigma n in Rn plus one is a closed hypersurface, then there exists. So you only get local resistance as long as um, well as long as the first moves. This is well defined, but um, of course, there might be singularities in large time. This is 
epsilon greater than zero such that there is a mean curvature flow evolution. Sigma t for t in zero to eta with um, sigma zero equal to sigma. Smooth, unique. So the uniqueness part is coming from the maximum principle. So you starting from the same hypersurface, so you wouldn't have two distinct evolution because uh, the evolution are locally graphs. So the maximum of their difference, the maximum of the norm of the difference has to happen at zero. So if it's zero, they're, dis they're, they're agreeing, they have to be agreeing for all time as long as the flow is smooth. So. Any questions? Do you not need any regularity on the initial hypersurface? Yes, uh, when we are saying smooth, uh, closed, we mean, um, well, when we say hypersurface, we usually mean C infinity smooth hypersurface. But that's a good point indeed. That's stronger than what we need, as you mentioned. So we mark. The condition can be reduced to Lipschitz submanifold. Two. But even though initially it's not smooth, it might be Lipschitz, have corners or stuff. As a parabolic equation, have an uh, instant smoothing effect. So let's uh, see, for example, it's going to be instantly smooth. Say you have an initial hypersurface, which is, um, which is um, this half sphere and union with a disk. And of course, it has a corner here, not smooth. So if you evolve under mean curvature flow, it will instantly smooth out. Uh, so it should be something like this, round it out. And the flat part will become instantly curved. So for any t in zero epsilon, so not including zero. The evolution is smooth. And actually there's no flat point anymore. So every point become instantly positively curved in this case. So this initial surface, you can see that it's actually positively curved inward even though there are, my, there are singularities, but weakly it's positive. And then it will become a smooth convex hypersurface instantly. This is called the local smoothing effect. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so uh, now we have the, uh, okay, so let me make one more remark. So this local, local assistance, um, one needs to prove it for any parabolic flows. But in this mean curvature flow case, it's actually simpler by reducing it to the graphical equations. So in other geometric flows, so there's also such issues of um, diffeomorphism invariance, which makes the equation 
not uniformly parabolic. But in the Ricci flow, there's no graphical expressions. So there are some um, other ways that people apply. It's already dealt with, of course, in the history. But in Ricci flow, there's the so-called de Turk trick. So it's also a procedure of restricting the direction how the how the surface or hypersurface or the Riemannian manifold is going to is going to evolve. Originally, you are flowing the whole piece. It doesn't matter. There's no sense to keep track of each point. It doesn't matter what each point is flowing direction is, but you can restrict it to a fixed direction that it can flow to. So in the mean curvature flow case, by restricting so that each point can only flow in the normal direction, you make the problem parabolic. In the Ricci flow case, you, you, choose, a, you choose a fixed vector field to, to, fix the, to fix the diffeomorphism invariance. But that's more complicated because it's a tensor problem, not the, not the, not the scalar problem. It cannot be written as a graph locally. But um, these issues are, local resistance are not a problem in geometric flows. What we care more about is the long time behavior. That's the real issue of studying the topic. So about uh, the long time behavior, we have, we have already seen that the singularities are inevitable, but let's uh, first have a first criteria that when singularities occur, what is happening? Criteria for singularities. All right. Theorem. So the second fundamental, so let's um, say sigma t is mean curvature flow evolution. And as singularity at time t. Then the second fundamental form has to go to infinity as T approach T. As T approach capital T the singular time. So proof. So the second fundamental form, um, well, that's, uh, don't worry about the uh, definitions that much. That's just the uh, passion of the embedding. So if you view F as a mapping, as a hypersurface, the second fundamental form as the matrix is exactly the Hessian matrix projected to the normal direction. You take in the product of the hypersurface. So if you, if you have second fundamental form bound, that gives uniform second derivative bound. And as a consequence of that, that gives you the local uniform C2 bound on as a graph. So suppose not if A sup 
lamb soup, T go to T is less or equal than C less than infinity. Then sigma two, sigma T are uniformly bounded in C2. So the curvature is second derivative. And if you write it as local graphs, that is equivalent to a local C2 bound on the graphs. And then one can apply the azela ascoli So uniform C2 can be compactly embedded into C1 alpha for any alpha between zero and one. So sigma t and compactly embedded so you can find the subsequence, can find subsequence of time ti go to t such that, so it's compactly embedded, so there is subsequence that is converging in C1 alpha to a limit. So appropriately, this is going to be a limit that might depend on the choice of subsequence. But in this case, it's not because uh, as t go to t, you can see that this is actually a Cauchy sequence because what is, this, uh, what is the evolving speed? It's equal to the mean curvature, which is of course uh, less. So the, this is the chase of the matrix. This is the full matrix. Of course, the norm of the chase is less than equal to the norm of the full matrix, so you have a uniform speed bound, which means that sigma t is a Cauchy sequence in Hausdorff distance, or in uniform distance, whatever you call it, because the there is a uniform speed, speed bound, which means that The limit has to be the, the limit has to be independent of the choice of subsequence in the Hausdorff sense. But converging in C1 alpha implies the convergence in Hausdorff, of course. So it has to be the same limit. S to be independent of choice of Ti. So you can now define, so define sigma t, originally sigma t, sorry, capital T. Capital T is a priori the assumption that uh, you develop a singularity as t tends to, small t tends to capital T. So now it's independent of the subsequence. So you just define it to be to be the sigma infinity independent of the subsequence. And this is in C1 alpha. And well, C1 alpha of course is Lipschitz. So one can then apply the local well postness theorem. to extend the flow at least a little bit more. T plus epsilon one, say epsilon one is greater than zero. And every time slice is still in C1 alpha, 
but recall that C1 alpha, of course, give a uniform gradient bound locally as graphs. And parabolic shelter theory tells you that this can be improved to C infinity. So you have actually smooth, smooth smoothness of the flow without singularity, at least a little bit of time beyond T. So that's a violation, so which means that if it develops a singularity, it has to have second fundamental form for the full curvature blowing up. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, I got disconnected or something. Uh, no, everything's okay. fine. Okay, good. All right, so uh, that's the first criteria. And in order to study the singularities, um, we want to we want to study the evolution of geometric quantities and see how these geometric quantities evolve near a singularities. And through controlling the geometric quantities, we can control the behavior of the singularities. Right, to de derive such equations, we actually want some intrinsic equations. We want the equation to be written using the induced metric of the submanifold. So to do that, we will, um, want to write equations. So that's our next topic. Equations using induced metric. All right, so, uh, well, because it's as a hypersurface, so the, it's actually easier than the Ricci flow maybe because uh, the induced metric, if you compute the derivative, divergence, anything, the, as a hypersurface, the derivative are just the full derivative the ambient space projected to the hypersurface, right? So sigma. So this is also, uh, we will compute some evolution equations using the intrinsic metric. And this is also uh, serve as a review of some manifold geometry. So to pick it up uh, if people are not familiar with it, but we will not spend a whole lot of time to, uh, to just review the some manifold geometry. So we will use this uh, computation to serve as a review process then. So the gradient, so when we add this uh, script sigma, that means the gradient with respect to the induced metric. Say F is a function with enough regularity to compute derivative, but um, we can without loss of generality in this case, we just consider smooth functions. So this is equal to the full gradient minus the normal direction, the projection of the gradient to the normal direction. So DF, you project it to the normal direction and then times that, simple. And the divergence so this uh, this d means the the gradient with respect to so let me move this downward here d means 
gradient in R n plus one without the subscript. And for any vector field, R n plus one to R n plus one, we can compute the divergence of this vector field with respect to the induced metric. That is again equal to the full divergence minus the projection to the normal direction. And this is the spatial derivative. For time derivative, there's a subtle point that we want to emphasize here. We want to distinguish DDT and partial partial T. Right. So now you uh, suppose So you write it as a, you write the sigma t mean curvature flow in Rn plus one. What's this dn? Uh, where is dn? Oh, uh, that's the, d means the dn plus one indeed. Uh, sorry, dn means the dn means the uh, directional derivative v with respect to the normal, n is the normal direction. So you, uh, the divergence is the full divergence minus the normal part of the divergence. So sigma t, you can write it as a, well, you can view it as a space-time submanifold. That's the space-time track, say here, sigma t, each sigma t, space-time track of the submanifold, or of the mean curvature flow, that's a submanifold in Rn plus one cross R. And say F again is uh, now depending on time because we want the computer time derivative. It's a function uh, M plus one cross R. And by partial partial T, we mean that, let me draw more clearly here. This is your sigma T time slice. By partial partial t, we mean that the time derivative in this direction. And by ddt, we actually mean that the derivative tangent to the space-time track. This is ddt. But partial partial t is um, it's just a partial derivative. in this space time and ddt let's uh let's move this upward sorry let's erase this move this upward and ddt is that tangent direction so you will have to add the actual direction. So for any vector field, uh, for, for any function f, partial partial t of f plus square f h. So these are vectors. So the geometric meaning of DDT of a function is actually that you are supposing you are tracing your point along the mean curvature flow in the normal direction. 
in the in the direction that the point is we are supposing that the point is flowing in a normal direction in the in the mean curvature vector direction. And this is the directional derivative that is actually tangent to the tangent to the space-time track. Because h is the velocity vector field, so uh, this is your h. So their sum is equal to d dt. So these are different for functions that are defined in the whole space-time. But uh, we don't distinguish this true if you are just considering functions that are defined on the evolving hypersurface. So in this case, if it's defined on the hypersurface, you can always extend the definition to a local tubular neighborhood. On. So you have a hypersurface, you can always, for a function defined on the hypersurface, you can always extend the definition to require that it's constant along any normal direction. Locally as long as the as long as the as long as the normal graph are still a hypersurface. So you can require that require that um, it's constant along these normal directions. And then you can use whatever cutoff smooth functions that you like to extend it to the whole RN. But the derivative only concerns a tubular neighborhood, of course. So you can, um, in that case, in that case, the spatial gradient is zero, of course. And these two notions of uh, these two notions of uh, derivative t are the same. Okay. Any questions? regarding this. All right, um, we have three minutes left. It's uh, slower than I actually expect, but uh, we'll try to adjust the time a little bit. Uh, since there's only three minutes, there's, um, we can't really finish the next uh, theorem or so. So we will call it the end of today. And uh, there's still three minutes. I can still take uh, two minutes. I can still take some questions. If you have any questions relating to what we've been talking about today. Or otherwise, I will see you the same time next week. Hopefully there's no uh, sharing screen problems again. Do you mind just going over the argument of the uniqueness in the theorem on uh, the existence of the uh, local flow? Right. So that's a consequence of the maximum principle, of course. Um, Right, so if you have two evolutions, sigma one, sigma two, they can, so uh, for, for small enough t, you can always write it as a local graphical expression. So sigma one of t, say it's uh, sigma zero plus u one of t, sigma two of t, and in the normal direction, u2 of t in the normal direction. And these are two normal graphs. And if they differ, if they differ, then you can, um,
so if you if you compute the if you compute the 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 difference of u one and u two, this norm satisfies the maximum principle two as a, so this is not using the tangential principle. This is using the this is using the um, satisfies the um, maximum principle. So if if at some later time. They don't agree. Well, actually, the parabolic maximum principle just tells you that the max of u1 minus u2 at any time t is less or equal than that's the maximum principle that we are using. So we will get to this maximum principle later in the course. Okay, thank you. Is that a similar idea would work to prove the tangential principle as well? Yes, you can write the difference as a, well, yeah, of, of course you can always write the, always write the write difference equation, use the maximum principle of the, of the difference equation. I mean, the difference equation also satisfies parabolic equation, so the difference equation wouldn't have um, something like uh, local maximum or local minimum. And because if they differ, this is a closed hypersurface, you always have local maximum or local minimum at the later point. And then you can, and then you can, um, apply this uh, maximum principle in the backward parabolic ball which uh, gives the contradiction, basically. Cool, thank you. Okay. Right, and uh, basically that's um, what we are gonna talk about today. And also please do let me know if uh, there are mistakes or typos that you find on the lecture note that you want, you want me to, um, yeah. It's, it's all on the website. And this lecture note, I will also post it on the website. Oh my God, uh, did I record the whole thing? So hopefully I did record the whole thing so that I will post the record the video link to the, to the website too. I hope I did record that, okay. Uh, okay, thank you and see you next week. Have a good week. Cheers, see ya. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.